go to interest only, it's harder. They're quite like, if you've got, they want 200,000 of equity in the property, minimum income of 75 so, grand. Uh, okay. So it works for wealthy people. It's less, they might do it at a push if people really get into trouble. Mm. I think they're gonna try and like keep repossessions low. Yeah. But they, you know, the reason they're doing this is to squeeze people's income. So they wanna. Mm. Completely. Yeah. Mike, welcome to Taking Stock After the Bell, episode 10. Had to bring out the big guns for this one. Um, Mike Bell is a global market strategist with JP Morgan. He is responsible for producing research-driven insights on the global economy and markets and communicating them to institutional and retail clients and the media in UK and Europe. Prior to joining JP Morgan, Mike worked for seven years as an investment strategist on the economics and asset allocation team at Seahor Private Bank in London. Mike, thanks for coming along, thanks giving for us up sort of 40 minutes of your time. Hopefully not to scare us too much <laughs> based on the conversation in the last 10 minutes. Um, we've been talking about mortgages. This is from The Telegraph. You sent this to me, John, during the week. Um, the mortgage time bomb about to explode under middle class Britain uh, per Adam Fraser. Adam Fraser, which I think is not his actual name based on this. Uh, Adam Fraser, 42, and his wife who bought their £7 million house in Berkshire in July last year, having secured a mortgage in the January. You can see where this is going. Quote from Adam, it was at the tail end of when there was still good deals to be had. We passed our affordability test with flying colours and so I had no problem buying at the top of the market. Here we go. At the time, Fraser was a partner in the startup he had co-founded and received hefty dividends twice a year with which he was planning to pay down his, his 5.25 million pound mortgage. Of this, 2.75 million was fixed for five years at 1.49%, with a cool 2.5 million on a variable rate, which was then 1.89%. This is Adam again. I genuinely thought that I'd be able to pay down the variable side of my mortgage really quite quickly. As it turned out, that was the worst decision in history. Thoughts? Two and a half million, and rates have gone up by four percent. That's hundred thousand pound a year of interest cost. Ouch. I mean, it's a big number, but this is. I mean, I don't think you know. Obviously, that's an extreme example, but this conversation is going to be happening over the next couple of years, right? Year. I think yeah. Obviously, it's a very big number there, but your average person. They're going to face the fact that you go from something like a one and a half percent mortgage rate to a five percent mortgage rate. Mm. If assuming you're on a repayment mortgage, your payments go up by more than fifty percent. So what you're seeing at the moment is people trying to term out the debt a bit. So you go from a thirty-year mortgage to a thirty-five-year mortgage, but that still only takes you from your payments going up fifty-five percent to going up forty-six percent. Mm. Right. So it's still going to hurt, and I think the risk is, and you can see on the chart. Yeah, the, this, is, this is one that we've nicked from you before in the past, I'm afraid, but yeah. given, given you know, you've included it in the pack, I'm really keen to hear your thoughts. Well, I think the problem is that there's a little bit more of a lag than there would have been in the past. Mm. And so the risk is that the Bank of England just keep on putting rates up until it hits the economy, not taking into, the, into account the fact that the interest rate tightening that they've already delivered just hasn't fed through yet. Mm. Right, so what this chart is showing you is at the beginning of the year, you only had about 13% of people on variable rate mortgages. And so those people have felt it all as it's come through. But by the end of this year, you look at that chart on the right hand side, about 60% of the two year fixes are going to have expired and ballpark a fifth of the five year fixes. So that's going to take you from 13% of people to nearly 40% of mortgage holders who will have felt that tightening. And then if that's not enough to cause a recession, by the end of next year, you go from 40% to 60% of people who will have felt it. So to me, it seems highly probable that as this <clears throat> tightening that's already been delivered just feeds through into people's monthly payments when their fixes come to an end, it's going to cause them to have to cut back pretty substantially on eating out and you know discretionary spending in a way that will tip the economy into recession and these people who are mortgage holders typically working age 
they're the ones who are going out would be going out spending money in the broader economy so there's probably a bit more of a knock-on impact than I mean, the point we've made in the past is that more people in the UK own their house outright than have a mortgage. Mm. Those tend to be older people. Yeah, I think there's two things to consider there. One, as you say, that those younger people probably have a higher propensity to consume. Yes. So, you know, in simple terms, what you're saying there is if you take money away from them, there, that's going to have more effect mm. on the economy than giving a bit of extra money on savings to some of the older people who may la- be less likely to go out and spend that. But I mean, you, you are getting a bit of an offset there because there will be people with some savings who are getting a higher return on that now. But I personally don't think that's going to be sufficient to the offset, offset the hit them. And the other thing that's that that is quoted about not that many people actually having a mortgage. If you look at it, it's broadly speaking, a third of people own a home without a mortgage, broadly speaking, the older people. Mm-hmm. And then you've got people in the kind of 30 four to 55 category who own with a mortgage generally. And then you've got the younger people who rent. Mm -hmm. And rent is also going up a lot, of course, because a lot of landlords have mortgages. And if you're on an interest only buy to let mortgage, then the increase in interest rates that's coming through at the moment is actually much more severe than for a repayment mortgage. Because you go from a 3% interest only mortgage to a 6% interest only mortgage, your payments go up 100%, whereas you go from a 1.5% repayment mortgage to a 5% repayment mortgage, your payments go up about no. 55%. So obviously landlords can't put up their rent by 100%, but they are trying to feed it through to people. So it's not just the mortgage holders who are getting squeezed, it's younger people as well getting squeezed by those high rents. Is there any evidence in the data that the economy is beginning to feel it? I mean, uh, retail sales were okay, albeit they've been soft for a lot of the year. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't look like the economy is falling off a cliff. If anything, the worst prognosis from October in the mini budget, post mini budget period hasn't come to fruition and the economy has carried on quite strongly. Wage growth has held up and employment stayed mm-hmm. low. You know, we had a, an Im, sorry, fund management by anecdote, anecdote perhaps, but we had a, an impromptu trading statement from Next yesterday, and they had to do, what's the opposite of a profits warning? Uh, profits. Profit surprise. Know, surprise. So yeah. they guided for minus 5% like for like sales, and they reported yesterday they were actually plus nine year to date. And they'd seen a particularly strong April. Mm. So, and uh, you, you know, again, fun management by anecdote, but if you walk down the street around London, the Southeast, no signs of recession out there. So, I mean, are we gonna see it? When are we likely to see it? What, you know, how is it gonna feed through? So I think what's going on is that you've got most people getting quite decent pay rises, right? The mm-hmm. average pay rise at the moment is somewhere in the region of 6 to 7%. Mm-hmm. And so you get your pay rise, and as long as your mortgage hasn't reset yet, you're feeling better. Okay, other costs have gone up as well, of mm-hmm. course. So it's helping you catch up with the fact that your energy bill went, went up a lot. So it's not like everything's fantastic, but you just got a decent pay rise. But what's going to start to happen, and it's starting to happen very gradually now, you're reading the first few stories in the press about it, but you're going to get a lot more of those over the coming six to 12 months, is as some of those people's mortgages reset, yes, they've got a six, 7% pay rise, but I'd say their mortgage payment's going up 50%. Mm-hmm. And the question is just how many, of, how many people does that need to happen to in order for it to tip the economy? Mm-hmm. And exactly where does that tipping point come? Obviously, I don't think anyone knows exactly where the tipping point is, but you look at that chart on the right-hand side, and I think what you could say with a relatively high degree of confidence is that by the end of 2024, it's going to have hit enough people that it's pretty unlikely we're not in recession by then. So, I mean, again, we've discussed it before, but it typically takes, I think, six quarters to feel the impact of a rate hike. Um, we're, We're obviously, we're more than six quarters in from the first couple of rate hikes now. Um, We'll see the markets pricing in more rate hikes from the Bank of England. Do you think it's done too much so far and actually there's an argument for a pause as opposed to carry on tightening? And actually we're going to look back at the end of the tightening and say they just did way too much towards the end. It's not clear to me that they've done too much right now, but I do think they can stop. I think all they really need to do is wait for the tightening that's been delivered mm. to actually feed through, and that will be sufficient to tip the economy. We've got a CPI event tomorrow, don't we? Yes. 
And of course, everyone's very focused on inflation, rightly so, it's high at the moment. But I just question, you know, how sticky can that core inflation remain in a world where that many people are all of a sudden having to cut back on their spending? Mm -hmm. So I think the inflation dynamic can change quite quickly once this starts to feed through to more and more people. So almost you can hold for good few months to see the impact of these mortgages or the, the people exposed to higher rates coming through and watch the inflation number start to fall in terms of core. If it, if I was at the Bank of England, which obviously I'm not, but if it was me, I would mm. I would pause till the end of the year, see if this hit coming through yeah. is enough to tip the economy into recession and get unemployment higher and hence wage growth and core inflation pressures coming down. If not, they can always go a little bit further personally don't think they need to because the risk is that you just keep on going you know, I think someone talked about the fall in the shower analogy right you turn the tap up and it takes a little bit of time to heat up mm. so you keep on cranking it up you just if you end up cranking it all the way yeah. as yeah. hot as it yeah, will go yeah, yeah. then you're going to get burnt and mm. that I think is the risk but is this not what happens every single time that we over tighten and we over loosen in short yes but I think so. I mean, history says we're going to make that mistake. I just, I just question why, because I think we all probably agree on this that a, a sit and wait and see what happens seems to be so unappealing. The central banks to actually follow that course of action. I mean, you had somebody in the Fed that wanted to raise another full point. Mm. I mean, I, I think the problem that the central banks have got is it's clear, it's obvious in hindsight. And to many, it was yeah. obvious at the time they were too slow getting started. Mm. So they feel in catch up mode, um, particularly the Fed, but also the Bank of England as well. So, you know, they started too late. Well, damn it, you know, we're, we're behind the curve. And now I think I agree there is absolutely no harm in them sitting and waiting. But I don't think that's what, we're gonna, what they're going to do. And we find out Thursday again, don't we? Thursday. I think it's Thursday, CPI print tomorrow, isn't it? I think, yeah. And so yeah. Thursday again. Yeah. It's a really hard job. It's a really hard job. But sit and wait and see it doesn't seem to be a terror I just question why they aren't I don't think they will wait I think they no. will hike and I, you know I kind of understand why because they're worried about wage price spiral and right? mm. they're worried that with wages that are growing at this pace um, that could offset these higher mortgage costs and then you get into this wage price spiral but ultimately sadly I think the case is you're not going to get inflation down to the kind of levels that the Bank of England want without a recession. The question really is just at what level of interest rates will cause a recession once it feeds through? And are we there already? I personally think they've done enough already to yeah. cause that recession. They just need to wait for it to hit. Yeah. But, you know, it's, that, it is a difficult job for them. And I think one has to be fair to them and not try and judge a People will, will inevitably talk about a policy mistake if we get a recession. Right? A recession is sadly required in order to get inflation down from these levels. Um, so I think the it ends up being a mistake only if they tighten so much that the recession ends up being deeper than it needs to be, rather than just getting a recession, which I think sadly is pretty much a requirement now. Yeah. So are you bearish UK assets, sterling, bullish bonds? I'd be pretty bullish on UK gilts. I think if you look at what's priced into UK gilts, uh, the, the market- On the side? Well, just that on the nominal level, the market's pricing in that rates are gonna stay pretty high for several years. Mm, the yield goes and, flat all the way out, isn't it? You know, whilst it may well be that interest rates go a little bit higher than where we are now, I personally really struggle with the notion that interest rates are gonna stay as high as the market is pricing over the next two to three years. Mm. I think, they will tighten, you will get a recession, and then once you're in recession and unemployment has gone up, wage pressures then moderate, core inflation comes down, mm. and that will allow them to cut rates. My best guess is they don't come all the way back down to zero, but I think they need to cut rates to something like two and a half percent. And we might get there a lot sooner than people think, right? It's perfectly plausible in my mind that you could see two and a half percent base rates from the Bank of England by the end of next mm. year. August 2026 when the Raymond House sells remortgaging. It might be all right. <laughs> might be all right. <laughs> Do you reckon they move the inflation target? Well, they can't even talk about that now. 
No. Because obviously they're trying to get inflation down. So the worst thing you could do is talk <laughs> yeah, about no. moving it up. But I do think that once inflation comes down to lower levels and everyone's no longer worried about inflation as much, then I think it may well make sense to increase inflation targets. Mm. Because structurally, I think what's going on is we're in this environment where we're coming up against tighter labor markets. Mm. And I think that is going to happen more frequently over the next 20, 30 years as the population ages. And so I think having a higher inflation target probably does make sense over the next 20 years. It's just that now is 100% the wrong time to be letting on that that's what mm. might happen. Mm. And it be interesting for people listening, but in turn, we, we talked a lot about mortgages. How many outstanding mortgages are there in the UK to give people an idea of the percentage of the population that are exposed to UK mortgages? It's about 7 million mortgages, give okay. or take. And then, but then obviously renters are, as you said, exposed to mortgage hikes as well because rents go up too. Yeah. Um, and, and what percentage of households in the UK don't have mortgages? Well, so it's a, if you so if you take renters as not mm. having a mortgage, although as you say they're obviously yeah. exposed, yeah. and then you so they're about thirty yeah. percent, and then you've got the people who own without a mortgage. Generally, they're older. They're again about a third. So it's only about a third of the population who own with a mortgage. Mortgage. Mm. But as I say, the renters are obviously exposed. Yeah, well. so this doesn't, so rate hiking doesn't influence everyone necessarily. But as we said, the type of person that's exposed to a mortgage ten, is probably the larger spender anyway because they're in a, their earnings, they're younger, they're, um, whereas older, more retired, you know, older people that are retired typically spend less um, than, than younger people with families and things. Yeah, and I mean, that is the big question mark mm. is are, are you going to see those people and of course not all older people have got lots of savings right some mm. do mm. But not all do mm. um but of those older people who don't have a mortgage who are sat on a decent amount of savings and they're finally after a decade of hardly any return on that able to get something yeah. from it are they going to go out and spend it they might do and so there is some wiggle room there the question really is just what level of interest rates is too high yeah. and we can all debate that that's what the bank of england need to try and work out i personally think that you don't need to go further than five percent but we'll see we'll see um you mentioned there about one of the structural issues with inflation is the drop off of payroll employees or the workforce basically that we've seen over the last couple of years johnny this was the ons chart isn't it, it was i spent an afternoon deep in the office of national statistics website lucky actually. mrs raymond um, <laughs> so this is payroll employees back to basically the trend line that we saw i mean we've we've said this a bunch of times the amount of things where you can see COVID on the chart mm. and it's so obvious and then you come back a couple of years and we're coming back to trends but um yeah, the, we had a little bit of drop off and, and probably no no reason necessarily to dwell on why that was the case. There was a lot of people off long term long sick. sick was a big issue, yeah. And um, and people discouraged and students and there's the, yeah, lots lots of things going into that, but it's definitely encouraging to seeing the labour force expanding again and getting back to that pre COVID trend because, you know, for the last year or two there's been a real shortage of labour and that's why wages have gone up so much, particularly in kind of leisure and hospitality mm. and at the lower end of the of the wage force so yeah this is kind of good news i think yeah 100 percent um wages going up but a heck of a long way behind inflation still which is probably to your point mike that people are feeling that you know even though they've had that pay rise it's not necessarily keeping up with inflation so they're not going to be feeling like they're mega loaded even though they've had a wage rise i guess i think that's it right so people have had a reasonable pay rise but their energy bills have gone up the price of food i mean even quite wealthy people are noticing the price of food. If you're not that well off, then that hits really hard because it's a higher percentage of your total spend. Um, so yeah, it, people have already felt a cost of living squeeze over the last year. And now some of that inflation is gonna come down, right? So you're not gonna get the same magnitude of energy price increases. And in fact, energy bills might come down a little bit. Yeah. Um, food prices probably aren't gonna come down, but they might go up less quickly so you get a bit of an easing in terms of you may well still see wage growth reasonably strong and headline inflation coming down but of course what that headline inflation doesn't capture is the mortgage payments and so just as the cost of living squeeze from mm. 
um, higher food and energy bills starts to ease a little bit, you're going to have not everyone, but a proportion of people, as we've discussed, chunky proportion, getting hit again in what will feel like a pretty relentless um, attack on their kind of <clears throat> living standards. So the the backdrop looks for UK consumer looks pretty tricky. Essentially, what you're saying. Yeah, I think I think that in aggregate you're going to see a pullback in discretionary spending. Mm. It will be highly uneven because, you know, you've got this, you could say it's unfair, it's just the way it is, situation where there are some people on a five-year fix getting a 7% yeah. pay rise and feeling great about things. Mm -hmm. And then there are some people maybe getting a 7% pay rise, but as I say, their mortgage payment's going mm. up 55%. And, you know, maybe some people did make the decision to pay down early and but most people let's face it it's a bit of luck really mm, it's when your mortgage yeah, expired yeah, 100%. and so there's gonna i mean it all depends yeah when you're originally fixed for yeah if you've got two years left and you know it just so happens that you bought a house whenever it was then yeah that's not planning it's just luck mm. yeah, yeah and you've got to remember that two years ago when people were mm. the people whose two-year fixes are going to run out this year everyone was saying rates are going to stay low for a very long time right mm. lower for longer mm. was what everyone was talking about. Technology, productivity gains, disinflationary. Demographics. Yeah. Demo well, we'll get, we'll get on to demographics in a second. Just for, I mean, anytime, well, as an investor, we don't necessarily talk about macro all that much, and especially not at the minute, because it's so confusing. I mean, there's so much conflicting data, and it must be, for some, I'm intrigued to know, for someone that does your job, does it feel like a really difficult environment at the moment, or is this just always how it is? I mean, I mean, obviously, predicting the future is always difficult. Mm -hmm. and we wouldn't yeah, try and say tricky. otherwise. But I do think that where we are right now is more uncertain than normal. I personally don't think so much in the UK because of all the things we've discussed. To me, it's relatively clear cut that yeah. that's going to cause a cutback in spending. But elsewhere in the world, it's a less clear picture. And some of that is because of things that have happened since the pandemic and the unusual nature of post-pandemic recovery. And some of it is just because some of the key lead indicators of the economy that people monitor, things like business surveys, are pointing in completely different directions, even though they're meant to be surveying the same thing. Mm. Right, so to give you one example, in the US, they have a non-manufacturing sector survey. Right. And which is done by one group uh, at the Institute for Supply Management. And then they have another service sector survey, which is done by S&P Global. And they're basically meant to be surveying a pretty similar group of companies about the same broad questions. And one of them is verging down towards recessionary levels. And the other one is picking up quite nicely. And that is unusual, right? Normally, those surveys point in the same direction. Really? Mm. Right, so it's always hard to predict the future, but it's particularly hard at the moment when you've got this divergence between some of the key lead indicators telling you different stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the UK we've covered on, but you, you also sent these through, Mike, as well, which we'll touch on. Um, it's a slightly different story in, in the States with mortgages um, not anywhere near as exposed to rising interest rates. Probably the States looks like in a much better economic footing. Is that is that fair? Yeah, and I think people in the UK really struggle to get their head around this because whenever I talk to our American clients, mm. they honestly can't believe that here in the UK there are people with only <laughs> two-year fixes. Yeah. Mm. Right? Because 80% of the mortgages in America are fixed for 30 years and then another 15% are fixed for at least 15 years. So you've got 95% of all the mortgages in America are fixed for at least 15 years. And so a lot of them managed to refinance at somewhere around 3% for 30 years. Now, that is a problem for the economy because it, what you can't really do in America is take that mortgage rate with you. They don't have many portable rate mortgages. And so people are, if they're not in their forever home, they're kind of trapped. So yes. you're a family, you want an extra bedroom because you just had another kid or whatever. That's a problem because if you want to move home, you go from a 3% mortgage rate to a 7% mortgage rate, 
and that's is a that serious rates, problem. Is that what rates are now for 30 years? Yeah, 30 year mortgage rates have gone from a low of 2.8 to about seven. So it's what it's doing is causing existing home sales <laughs> to be very weak. Mm. So people are not moving home in, a, in any meaningful way. But as you can see from that chart on the left hand side there, what is not happening is what is going to happen in the UK, that people who are living in their current home are getting squeezed. Right? As long as you stay put and don't need to move, you've locked in your low rate, and so you're not feeling that squeeze on incomes, no. and wages in America are going up, not quite as strongly as they are here in the UK, but they're still going up about 6%, if you look at the Atlanta Fed's median wage growth tracker. Um, and so if you're getting a 6% wage gain, and your mortgage is fixed, then you're in a much better position. So it does slow any other thing in the states. We had U.S. CPI last week, didn't we? It's four percent headline CPI. Mm -hmm. It's four percent, and it's coming down. Yeah. And I think Dave, you've got a yeah. chart that's on you, yeah. So and I think next month again, it's set to be even weaker, isn't it? So you know, U.S. inflation on a sort of rolling run rate is running about three percent, and you're 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 seeing six percent wage growth, and you haven't got to worry about your mortgage going. Mm -hmm. So the backdrop is totally different. It looks like this year, right? I mean pretty famous last words, but it looks like the Fed have drained it. Well, we've, uh, we had a note this morning from uh, T.S. Lombard, who we see, uh, we get their work every day, and Dario mm -hmm. Perkins there has, has talked about the odds of a central bank pulling off a soft landing, and he's written a piece this morning about how it's looking increasingly like they may just do it, That's particularly in the US, mm. well, which think, would be extraordinary. I think in the US, inflation is going to come down without a recession. The question is whether you'll then get the recession anyway. Um, I think that, you know, you can see from this chart here, as that June number falls out next month from the year on year number. That's a monster, isn't it? You're gonna get quite a sharp pull. So you're probably gonna have an inflation number next month that comes in somewhere like three and a half, maybe even slightly lower. That's amazing. And that is all also though, including still quite sticky core inflation. And core inflation is sticky, largely because of shelter. In other words, yeah. rents. Now, it's a slightly odd calculation how they do shelter in the US. But the main thing to know about it is that shelter inflation in the US is really reflecting what was going on in the economy about a year ago, when house prices were going up 20% and rents were going up something like 15 16%. Whereas if you look today, house prices are actually broadly flat year on year. In America, in some places, Seattle, San Francisco, they're down more than 10%. Yeah. Um, and rent growth has materially slowed from 15% down to somewhere between sort of zero to three. Mm. And so actual shelter inflation today is much lower than it's showing up in the um, numbers in the inflation. Numbers. Yeah. And that's going to feed through over the next year or so. Yeah. So I think inflation is going to come down. The question is just, has enough tightening already been put in place to cause a recession even though inflation comes down? So I think the Fed are going to be able to pause and stop putting rates up. I doubt they will cut rates until unemployment goes up. Yeah. The question is, are we going to see unemployment going up? And when you look at some of the loan demand surveys, I do think that is still a risk. Yeah, the this, is, this is the next, the next chart. No, oh, sorry, not that one, the one before. Yeah, there you go. Loan demand, absolutely walloped. Um, and around these sorts of levels, it tends to indicate a recession. Yes. I mean, typically when em employment cracks, so again, something we've discussed in the past, but typically when employment cracks, you're probably well into a recession already. It tends to be one of the last things because companies don't get a kick out of sacking people. I will try to avoid that scenario as much as they can, but um, this looks like a decent lead indicator, loan demand. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. and. So by the time unemployment's going up, you don't need an economist to tell you there's a recession. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So employment Your is- next door neighbor tell, is telling yeah. you there's a recession. And that is the last thing to go always. And the pattern that you tend to see in recessions is that interest rates go up, that causes a cutback on, in spending, um, or it means that companies find it more expensive to borrow to invest and then companies cut back on things like advertising mm. and then the next thing they cut back on is business investment 
And I think that's what's going on at the moment. If you look at this chart here, why are you seeing a big pullback in loan demand from businesses in the US? Mm -hmm. It's because everyone spent the last 12 months talking about recession. And so then normally what causes recessions is not actually consumers cutting back massively. Occasionally that's a cause of it. But the main reason you get recessions is because businesses cut back. They cut back on capex, business investment, and then that leads to, because you know, one company's capex or business investment is another company's sales. Yeah, yeah. That then leads to further cutbacks and you end up in a recession that way. So that I think is the risk. And of course it's exacerbated by all the pressures affecting the regional banks. Mm. Um, I mean, we could talk about that for ages. I won't go into too much depth on it, but broadly speaking, I don't think that we're completely out of the woods yet for yeah, some of the regional banks. Different. And it's gonna be harder to get a loan from some of those regional banks. And those regional banks, they lend to a lot of small businesses. And if you look at the stats, you might think, well, there are any small businesses. To what extent does that really matter? The answer is it matters a lot, right? About 45% of all Americans work for a business that employs less than 500 people. And about a third of Americans work for a business that employs less than 100 people. So small businesses, even though they don't employ a lot of people per business, mm. there's an awful lot of them. And they really are the kind of backbone of the labor market. Mm. And so if they start to cut back on business investment, which is what you're mm. seeing in things like the National Federation of Independent Business Small Business Survey, they're already starting to cut back on business investment. Historically, what happens next with a little bit of a lag is that eventually they cut jobs. And that, I think, is how you could end up getting a recession. It's a very fractured banking market in America compared to the UK, isn't it? Yeah. There's, yeah, I mean, there's thousands of small banks in America yeah. um, compared with over here. Really, the market is dominated by four or five big players. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, just just on the final, final thing then on banks, I mean, just, just that you sort of said, it doesn't feel like that's all over yet. If a bank wouldn't have had issues in the last couple of months, I mean, I guess the obvious question is what kind of causes it? Because you had a, a real moment in time there where it felt like it was quite sketchy. So, yeah, I, so mean, I think there were pretty rates. Right? There were two kind of risks, really. One was that as interest rates went up, some of the securities that these banks had bought, if they hadn't hedged them, went down in value. That then was causing people to worry about the hit to capital if they were forced to sell those. Um, and I think that most of that problem, although it's hard to say for sure, but most of that problem, the ones who've been hit hardest by that has probably happened. Um, you still have the issue though, that you can get around 5% putting your money into a money market fund mm. in the US. And the banks are generally paying a lot less than that, not just the small banks, most banks are paying less than that. So deposits have stabilized. They fell sharply after everything that happened in March. They seem to be stabilizing now, but there is still a risk that money could start moving out of the banks and into money market funds. So that's one consideration. But the bigger issue, I think, is that the next leg of this is likely to revolve around commercial real estate loans. So we all know, of course, that people aren't going to the office as much as they used to. If you look at unlisted commercial real estate values, they've gone down somewhere in the region of 15 to 20% from their sort of pre-COVID levels. If you look at listed office REITs, yeah, they're crucified. down about 50%. Mm. Now, if actual office values end up coming down somewhere in the region of 50%, and I think you know there'll be a lot of variation within that. Some of the highest quality offices will do a lot better in the right places. You're getting big variation between some of the hardest hit cities like San Francisco and some of the cities which are a bit better placed, perhaps like New York. But most of it, if these banks, the the commercial real estate loans, particularly these office loans, um, they sit on the balance sheet of, or there's a large exposure to them on the regional banks. Right. Yeah. Right. So about seventy percent of all the commercial real estate loans in America sit on the balance sheet regional banks and as a percentage of their total assets some of those regional banks have quite concerning levels of commercial real estate exposure and so the extent to which office values come down 
is going to be absolutely key for some of those regional banks. Now, I don't think this is 08 all over again. I think it's perfectly possible that you could see some more relatively small regional banks in the US come under pressure without it causing a financial crisis. If you look back to the 90s, you had lots of relatively small American banks fail and you had a relatively moderate recession. But I do think it means that a recession is probably more likely than not. Yeah. Because it's against that backdrop, those banks are less likely to be going out and making loans to small businesses and had to get the cut back in business capex. So it's that interaction between concerns around commercial real estate loan losses and what it does for lending to small businesses, which is how I think we move towards job cuts and a recession in the US. And how, how much of a recession do you think is priced into, we're talking about the US, so US markets? I know leadership's been very narrow through six or seven names, but the rest of you know, the border market has been fairly flat. But do you think there's, do you think investor sentiment and, and professional investors or institutional investors are still pricing in a recession or? I think less than it was, right? So we, I mean, if you, and this is obviously not a perfect guide, sometimes it goes down a lot more than this, mm. but if you think in a non-financial crisis recession, right, in a big financial crisis like 08, we all know stocks went down 50%. Off, yeah. 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 But if you avoid a financial crisis where, so people are not worrying about the biggest banks in the world yeah. going bust, maybe a few Stop. small banks are in trouble, but the major banks are, you know, they might not be doing as well as they were, but they're not teetering on the brink of collapse. Normally in that kind of scenario, stocks go down something like 25 to 30% in an average yeah. recession. Yeah. And by the end of September last year, the S&P 500 was down 25%. Yeah. Right, so yeah. we titled our outlook for 2023, a bad year for the economy, a better year for markets yeah, yeah, yeah. on yeah. the view that yeah. basically, yeah, we were gonna get a recession, which we still think, but that that was already priced in. kind of. The problem is markets have gone up since then and the recession hasn't happened yet. So it's not at mm. all obvious to me that stock markets need to go all the way back down to where they were in at the end of September. But I do think that the market has maybe got a little bit overexcited yeah. mm. and mm. is not pricing as much is, recession risk mm. as it was back then. Mm. Is and there you a, can sort of understand that because see, you know, inflation is coming down unemployment is still staying, the un unemployment levels are still very um, strong um, and actually sort of global output or US output looks fine as well. So you, you can understand why people are playing this soft sort of landing um, narrative. Is there is there a danger that, because we've got so used, the last couple of recessions have been blood and thunder, short, sharp, deep shocks that actually this one takes longer to play out because the process that you're talking about, Mike, feels like a slow moving train rather than shock and awe 2008 type well, events. I, I, I sort of characterize it when I was speaking to some clients this morning. You know, financial markets in 2022 adjusted quite quickly to higher rates as you saw the S&P, US markets, you know, the NASDAQ, the super mm. high growth got blown up in Q1. Then you had sort of weakness in June. Then you had the gilt markets in kind of October. Like financial cry financial markets had to deal with rates going from 0 to 5 in 2022. Yeah. This sort of feels like based on everything we've talked about so far, that 2023 and into 2024, the real economy is going to have mm. to try and deal with it. So the question is, have financial markets, you, you know, is it done and dusted and the S&P can carry on going up as it has been for the last three months? Or actually, is there a bit of a sting in the tail? And once the economy starts potentially weakening, you know, who's going to go and buy a thousand dollar, thousand pound iPhone when, um, or a new Louis Vuitton handbag when their mortgage rates have gone up, etc. Yeah. And I think the, the biggest uncertainty for me is how many people who were buying stocks since October last year were buying because they thought a recession wasn't gonna happen anymore mm. versus how many were buying because they thought, yes, a recession's coming, but that's priced. Right? Because the latter group won't necessarily sell if you get a recession because they already saw that coming. Mm. But I think some people have been probably buying since October on the view that we're gonna get this soft landing, you're not gonna get a recession. The cyclicals are pretty big now. And it depends where you look around the world as well, right? So you, you look at Europe as an example. European stocks have rallied very, very strongly. Yeah. I would argue they're not pricing much recession risk in at all now. Um, the US has rallied, but as you say, it's been quite concentrated in seven or so big names. 
Uh, things like the FTSE 250, they're not quite as low as they were back in October, but they are still down not been much of quite. A and I would argue that's probably right, because say, if you look around the world, yeah. the UK probably is the most likely to have a recession. But at least when you look at things like mid cap UK stocks, there's a fair amount of, well, I'd say fair, there's it's quite a lot yeah. of bad news yeah. priced yeah. in. Yeah. Bit, of, bit of depression in there, like, isn't there? About the asset class in general. Um, just when mm. we've got it on sectors, uh, Mike, this is another one you, you kind of sent across. Uh, S&P 500 tech versus financials. Um, a historically wide divergence there in terms of financials. Um, AI effect, question mark, a little bit. I, again, I think this is one of the hardest things that you just can't get away from, but it is probably the most important question for investors today, it is what is the fair valuation for those big mega cap tech, and we call them tech, they don't all sit in the tech sector, no. but you know the names I'm talking yeah. about, um, companies in the US. And really, I think you've got to go through them stock by stock, and that's not what I do for a living, but we obviously have people at our firm who do do that, and say, you know, just how big is AI going to be for company X, company Y? Does it justify a 25 times earnings? Because you look historically and the valuations on some of these growth stocks look pretty expensive. Mm. So it may well be that we look back on this in a few years time and think with the benefit of hindsight, people were getting a little bit overexcited about some of these tech stocks. Um, unless actually it turns out that AI and cloud and various other new products that are being launched at the moment really can justify mm -hmm. those multiples. And so I think I would say that probably on average, I think valuations are getting a bit stre stretched in some of those companies. But that's not to say that it is the case for all of them. No, I think that's right. And, and, and I, I sit and think to myself a lot during quiet times, so I haven't got much to think about is, you know, what's the right multiple for Apple? Here's the finest company in the world. If you were offered ten thousand dollars never to use an Apple product again, would you take it? As Warren Buffett once asked, the answer is probably not. Microsoft totally embedded. The thing in with corporations Apple, worldwide. The thing with Apple Man is like individually, it's either a luxury goods company or it owns the best toll road in the world, or, or it is a, a tech innovative company. Mm. Like or, or all of it three. does literally everything. Yeah. So so but, you know if you look at them company by company, you know Microsoft is 22 times right, is 27 mm. times mm. right, or is 35 times right. And, you know, the difference in share price of all those three different multiples is huge. But there's no real right answer to that. And the other thing, to come back to the other chart you've got about um, tech versus interest rates. Yeah. You know, when interest rates are naught, then this 30 one. times for Microsoft might be okay. Because what else you can do with your money? Mm. This uh, interest rates of, you know, US 10-year guilt, uh, sorry, US 10-year treasuries at four, four and a half, maybe 30 is too high. I don't so. That is the question for investors, 100%. Y euphoria is not interest rate dependent. No, that's is true. Is what I'm saying here. No, that's true. All based on this. You know, you can get people getting very excited about a certain development or a certain sector, regardless what interest mm. rates were. I think interest rates early 2000s were 5%. 5, 6, 7% in the late yeah. 90s. Yeah. And I think when I look at this chart, what's interesting to me is that, you know, many people sort of think that the way this should work is that when interest rates are low, the high growth stocks trade on high valuations and as interest rates go up, they come down in valuation, which mm. is what happened in 2022. Yeah. So all those growth stocks, the tech stuff got hit very hard. Um, but then of course, what's happened this year is actually not all of tech and not all of growth, but those big mega cap mm. growth names have rallied very strongly. Of course, as interest rates have continued to go up. But I think the big risk to those type of names is the market pricing for rates. So I actually think that what's priced into US rates is about right and that they will end up cutting rates. I think it's quite plausible that we get down to 3% by the end of 2024 on Fed funds, maybe even a little lower than that, um, in which case maybe the valuation on those tech stocks can hold up. But if I'm wrong about that, and bear in mind it's priced in that they're going to cut a fair way by the end of next year already, if actually interest rates are still around five by the end of 2024, or worst case scenario, they're at six or 7%, mm. then I think that's the big risk to these 
both companies. Mm. Um, last thing, guys, Mike, I wanted to get onto this because because this caught my eye and the pack that you sent across the the demographics and how the world isn't going to look as it as it has done over you know the past sort of fifty years moving into the future. So, do you want to talk us through this one? Yeah, I find this chart absolutely fascinating because it's quite rare that you get to a genuine inflection point. But I really think that so where good. we are right now, as you can see from the chart, is pretty much the inflection point for working age populations in most of the major developed market economies, at least. And what I would say about this is mainly don't assume that the future is going to look like the past. Right? Because ever since 1950, we've been in a world where you've had quite significant growth in working age populations, both in the West, mm -hmm. uh, but also fundamentally in China. Mm -hmm. And so the growth in the Chinese working age population meant that goods price inflation was very low because you had lots of people in China who could make stuff for the rest of the world at relatively low cost. And the growth in the working age population in the West meant the services inflation was quite low because there were lots of people who wanted to do jobs and so wage growth wasn't as high as it otherwise would have been. Mm -hmm. But now we're at this tipping point where more and more people are going to start retiring. You're gonna, they're still going to spend money. They might spend a bit less than they did when they had a job, but they're still going to be going out and spending money. And yet there'll be fewer people to work in the restaurants and cafes and places that they go to. And so that will put some upward pressure, I think, at least, although economists debate this, I think mm -hmm. it will put upward pressure on domestic service inflation over the yeah. long run. Mm -hmm. And as the population of China ages, then you're going to get less benefit from cheap goods as well. Unless, of course, that production moves somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You can look at this chart. And maybe some of that production can move to India, where the working age population is going to keep growing for some time. And what I didn't put on this chart is Africa. Mm. And the working age population of Africa is really going to increase a lot. Mm. Right? So the way it could all pan out nicely is if actually... They take up the slug. Yeah. Or, of course, if you need fewer people because technological advancements yeah. like AI mean that actually we don't need as many workers because AI can do some of the jobs. But a lot of people look at AI and they think, oh, it's going to take everyone's jobs. I think we'll, we actually need it to mm. because we're going to see far fewer workers. If AI doesn't take quite a lot of jobs, we're going to be coming up against these tight labor markets and hence inflationary pressures more frequently. Now, I still think you're going to get cyclicality within it, right? So you'll still get periods where when you get inflation, the central banks put interest rates up, it causes a recession, unemployment goes up, and so inflation comes down. So you're not going to have permanently higher inflation. No. But I think that the structural level of inflation over the next 20 years or so probably is a bit higher because you're not going to have that ever-increasing Chinese workforce making stuff cheaply, and you're not going to have an abundance of workers in the Western economies as they start aging. And that, as you can see from the chart, is just completely different to everything that realistically anyone investing today has lived through. No, and it's these, such a good um, chart. There's the world's biggest tailwind for healthcare biotech. I mean, just the, the aging population is going to need so much support in terms of medicine and technology going forward. Um, also, the divergence between Western economies. I mean, you look at the UK, we're 95% or so, maybe a bit less. And then you look all the way down to Italy, mm. which is 50. Mm. I mean, it's quite, and, and it's quite extraordinary. Germany at 70, it just shows how different the de demographics are of the West. And of course, the US is in the perfect position as always. I mean, it's just... <laughs> well, I mean, I think US growth is going to slow because its working age population is going to go up less quickly than it was. But um, yeah. yeah, relative to some of the other economies, the US is in a better position partly because they've had higher immigration and what you're seeing is that some of those they may not now be first generation immigrants but they tend to have more children mm -hmm. and so that's helping the demographic outlook for the US um, relative to some other economies where the fertility rate placement rate is yeah. not where it needs to be no. now of course you can solve all these problems with immigration I say there's loads of young people in Africa who 
yeah. would probably be quite keen to come and work in the West and the jobs that will be need to be done here. Sadly, though, historically, what you tend to see is that when economic times get difficult, particularly, you would think it was during periods of recession and I think you know that does play a part as well, but particularly during periods of inflationary pressure, what you tend to see historically is that the politics sways against immigration. Yeah. And so what is probably needs to be part of the answer, mm. how convinced am I that we're actually going to see many of these Western economies that need more immigration in order to offset their aging populations opening up, it's not obvious to me, at least in the next five to 10 years, that that's the direction of travel. No, after the last five to 10 years of politics that we've seen in the West, the populist, populist narrative, yeah. that might change. And I think you're right, I think the next 20 to 30 years, there will be sort of a global race for immigration if you want to keep your economy going. And it's not just the number of working age population, is it? It's the proportion of working age population as a whole because you've got an aging population as well because the baby boomers are all retiring so it's it's not just the absolute number it's how many of them are there relative to the entire population because it's the working age population that are paying the taxes today to service the spending predominantly on on health and welfare and social care and pensions etc so it's a kind of double-edged sword isn't it and you know demographics from a big picture perspective, are actually quite, quite easy to analyse, aren't they? Because the numbers are the numbers. You can't hide from a fertility no. rate and from the census data. And someone's born today, you know in 20 years' time they're going to join the working age population. And, and so um, it is fascinating. And, and, you know, you look at this chart and you'd probably you'd probably say short China, long India, wouldn't you, from a sort of from a sort of economic perspective? I'm not making any calls on the, the I mean, markets. I think, I think you just half, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think... If you just looked at that chart, it's exactly what you'd say. Right? The obvious point you've got to think about, though, with all investments is not just what's the macro outlook and the demographic outlook, but what's priced it. Yeah, totally. I'd say India's on more than 20 times earnings. Yeah. China's, China's on, on about 10. One of the other yeah. ways of implementing that view because mm. you cannot necessarily, that country's stock market may not be the best way of implementing uh, no, that thing. But, no, no. And then you've also got to think about it on a sector basis, right? So if you 100%. say there's clear implications for things like healthcare, mm. um, but also when you think about some of the risks, if people are aging, then there's going to be fewer people, if working age populations shrink, obviously it's working age people who pay mortgages. So if there's fewer people who need yeah. a mortgage because working age populations shrink, what does that mean for the banks, et cetera, et cetera, and mm. look through it country by country. Mm. Brilliant. Um, Mike, honestly, could have gone on for another <laughs> hour there, but no, you've got places to be. Thank you so much. That was really good fun. Will you, will you come back yeah, at some stage? I love to. Maybe for episode 100, we'll get you <laughs> back on. Um, thank you for listening in again, folks. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be sunning myself in Greece next Greece. week, so um, I'm not Very around. Nice. Very nice. You getting away anywhere yourself? We are going to Turkey in the first week of the school holiday, so a little bit longer to wait, but nice. not too long. Lovely. We'll Very enjoy nice. it when it arrives. Pack the factor 50. <laughs> Thanks very much, folks. See us in a couple of weeks. Um, if you've got any questions, email me at david.henry at Otherwise, we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you.